Um, I'm very pleased to introduce today's first keynote session titled Institutions and the Fortunes of Territories. And first of all, I would like to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Rodriguez Pose. Uh, good morning, Professor. Uh, Professor um, Rodriguez Pose is a professor of economic geography at the London School of Economics, part time professor at various EU um, universities, editor of economic geography, past president of the Regional Science Association International, and past vice president of the European Regional Science Association. And he notes remarkable research. I believe we talk about 180 published papers, including but in no way limited to the fields of um, regional development and growth, as well as international institutions and economic development. Um, he regularly advises several directorates of the European Commission and various others in international institutions. And in 2018, he was awarded the prize for regional science from the European Regional Science Association. So, and this is just a part of uh, his distinction. So we are very pleased to have Professor Pose here today with us. Thank you so much for your participation at ULEED's International Expert Exchange. <clears throat> We're looking forward to your presentation on the role, but if I understand correctly, foremost also on the relevance and uh, impact of institutions when it comes to development. And before I pass the floor, I would like to give you a very brief overview um, of the session. The session will last 40 minutes and unfortunately we're very much bound by this time frame. We will start with the presentation. It's going to last for 30 minutes and in this time slot you are invited to post your questions um, on the chats that we have created in YouTube and Facebook. And we will do our best to bundle those questions in a way that allows us to address as many of them as possible. However, as you realize that we have a very tight um, time schedule, I apologize in advance if we will not be able to come back to all of those questions today. Um, we also prepared a poll, uh, a question we would like you to vote on. <clears throat> My colleagues are depicting it already on the screen. You can do so by either following the uh, scan the code that you see on the screen right now and entering the code you see below or in the alternative you follow the link you find in the chat of YouTube and Facebook and again enter this code to vote. And what we would like to know is um, what in your opinion municipalities in Ukraine need the most to develop. Is it investment? Is it education and skills? Is it money? Is it good institutions and government? Is it trust and cooperation between people which in your opinion <clears throat> is the most important factor? And with that, I would like to um, pass the floor to uh, Professor Pose so that we can start with a presentation. Professor, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ageliki. It's uh, for me a great pleasure to be here with you. And I'm going to take my uh, headphones so that I cannot hear your nice translator, but let me see. I hope you can hear me now well. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you, uh, albeit been nice in Kiev, but uh, the circumstances of the pandemic not allowed. And what I'm going to be talking today is about the role of institutions in the development of territories, how having better institutions affects the fortunes of different territories in different parts of the world. So what I'm going to try to highlight is that there is a problem and we in the development community, everyone who deals with development from academics, to policymakers, to the people that suffer development policies are facing a problem. And this problem is related to how our understanding of uh, development has and growth has changed over time. Let me just start by highlighting that every development policy has two fundamental aims. The first aim is to try to uh, achieve greater jobs, Improve the number of jobs, but also the quality of jobs, and on the other hand, to lead to greater economic development. Having said that, for many, many years, this was thought to be a relatively easy task. It was just a question of putting more money into physical infrastructure, building more roads, building better trains, more motorways, airports, and other types of infrastructure like access to electricity, to clean 
digital communication, improving your human capital, investing in education, basic education, also on the job training, and improving the capacity of your firms to innovate. And with that combination, you would achieve better uh, jobs and more jobs and a greater economic growth. Of course, there was something that was not explained, and that was why I put that uh, interrogation mark over there, because with that interrogation mark, what happens is the part that is called the residual factor, the part that we don't know. But what has happened over time? Over time, what has happened is that our theories have improved, our data has improved. In theory, our capacity to design and intervene has also improved. But with the traditional factors, more infrastructure, more human capital and more innovation, we are explaining less and less. We're actually determining less and less of this economic development. This is the paradox. We have improved, but the fact that, that what has grown is what we don't know, which is mainly the interrogation point, is the residual factor. And if we take a look at how this affects policy, is that we are increasingly a bit in the dark about why the policies that we have used for the best of 40, 50, 60 years, depending on the cases, to promote development are working less and less. I just have to say that policies have generally worked, especially in the European Union, with some caveats. There has been a positive impact of the cohesion funds on regional development across Europe. And this impact has been growing over time. The European Commission, the European Union in general, has been learning and has been improving in dealing with uh, uh, cohesion funds. But there have been some significant declines in different axes of intervention, mainly on the cases of infrastructure. And I'm going to put some examples. And after all, I am, although I work in London, I am Spanish. And we have in Spain plenty of examples. Spain with Portugal is probably thanks to the cohesion policy, thanks to the structural funds uh, and the investment that has taken place there over the last 30 years. The two countries in the world with the best road infrastructure in Spain with the best railway infrastructure with the post airports. But despite all this effort, it has not helped those two countries and the regions in those countries to grow as much as it was expected. And there are plenty of examples of empty uh, high-speed train railways, empty airports, uh, uh, tall roads that go bust, uh, trains that don't carry enough passengers, and then you have situations that are go to the stream, like the one you see at the bottom, in which you see that, according to the FT, an airport in Spain, the airport of Ciudad Real, that cost uh, 1 billion euros was put on tender, and the biggest offer was just for 10,000 euros. Of course, it was not sold for 10,000 euros, it was put an offer on, on another bid the, the year later. But nevertheless, that's an indication of how much sometimes putting too much of something does not necessarily lead to the best outcomes. Of course, it can be worse because you have a country or you have other countries like, for example, Italy and uh, 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 Greece that have invested as much, if not more, on infrastructure and where Greece spent as much as Portugal, Portugal has got a significant amount to show for the changes that have taken place. Whereas in the case of Greece, what we have is less growth and in also less uh, infrastructure. So how do we explain this? How do we explain that uh, what we have seen has been a much lower level of uh, explanation of what we can do in terms of investment? Why has this question mark grown over time? And there's one answer because development policy has overlooked the quality of the institutions in which this activity takes place. And of course, when you when you look at institutions, we look at a lot of different uh, factors. It can be just things like simple rule of law. So how effective are your, uh, let's say, uh, tribunals, how effective are your courts, how fair they are, how well they work, your government effective, effectiveness, 
So the efficacy of your government in designing and implementing policy, the transparency, the accountability of governments, the level of participation of the population in those uh, decision making, and of course, the level of corruption and how pervasive is corruption in certain parts. So when we go, the, one of the problems that we had and included institutions in this mix of development was that institutions are very difficult to define and especially difficult to measure. We knew for a long time that the quality of government, that the level of corruption was much higher in certain parts of the world than in others, much higher in certain parts of Europe than in others, but we didn't know exactly how to measure that. This is something that has become far more developed, far more refined over the last three decades. It started mainly at the national level, but even now at the subnational level, at the regional level, where probably institutions make a bigger difference, what we have is a far better measurements of institutions. When you see there the map that is on your right, it highlights the quality of institutions as measured in a subjective way through a survey by the Quality of Government Institute at the University of Gothenburg, which is the one that has been more or less adopted in different cohesion reports by the European Commission, in which you see a significant variation of institutional quality across Europe. And it's not just the north-south or the east-west division, it's a far more complex one. You have some places in Europe that have excellent, excellent institutions. These are the Nordic countries, wherever you are in Sweden or in Finland or in Denmark, you have very good institutions, many parts of Germany as well. You have the polar opposite, which is those parts of Europe with the worst institutions. And this is not just in Eastern Europe. It's mainly concentrated in the southeastern corner of Europe, in places like Romania, in places like Bulgaria, Greece, Croatia, and the south of Italy, with places like, for example, Calabria and Campania having low quality institutions on a level, on a par with many regions, for example, in Romania and Bulgaria. And in between you have two groups. Uh, you have uh, the core of Europe going from Western Germany, but also through Belgium, through France and to the Iberian Peninsula, which is around the average, although it has deteriorated in the case of Spain, and also in uh, the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, all the way from Estonia to Slovenia, where the quality of institutions is below the average, but is significantly better than what you see in Southern Italy or in Bulgaria and in Romania. And of course, the quality of institutions can change over time. And you can see here the different waves. So what I show you was the latest one that we have, which was a map of 2017. But this exercise has been repeated in 2009, 2013. There's a certain level of stability. In some cases, what we have is significant differences within countries. The gap in institutional quality that you see between the south of Italy and parts of the north of Italy is as big as almost as what you can see across the whole of the European Union. And you have some cases where institutions have improved. That's the case, for example, of Estonia over this period of uh, time, and others where institutions have deteriorated. That's unfortunately the case of Spain, where you can see that the colors get darker over time. And this is something that we are now measuring in other parts of the world. This is another similar measure of quality of institutions in the case of China, but also in Africa, where the analysis is being done both at the national, but also at the subnational level. So the question is, if we include institutions in the equation, if we include institutions in the policy for development, what is the impact of those institutions? And what we are finding when we're doing these analyses is that the implications of poor institutional quality, the implications of lack of good governance for development are phenomenal in terms of both direct, how do they affect the capacity of different territories, the capacity of regions and cities and localities to actually develop, but also indirect in the way in which they do affect the quality of other policies, so let's say innovation policies, infrastructure policies, to actually deliver on their goals. What I'm going to present you in the next few minutes, very briefly, is a whole connection of what are these direct effects and ind indirect effects. And I want to highlight with uh, the next couple of slides that this is based on a lot of data. This is not just coming out of the blue. There's a lot of analysis and the results that come out of this work 
are extremely consistent throughout. So let me just go and summarize what the results. So let me just start with the returns of public policy. If you have certain levels of institutions, you have good quality of institutions, what you tend to have is correspondingly better types of investment in human capital, better types of investment in infrastructure, better types of investment in innovation. Whereas if you have much weaker, lower quality institutions, all those factors, you have less investment, not just less, but you also tend to have worse investment in those uh, three factors that are the traditional factors behind economic development. And when you put everything together, in places with better institutions, you have better policies for everything else, and you lead, or that leads to higher levels of employment generation and uh, more economic growth. If you have weaker institutions, the connection is very simple. You achieve lower growth and lower jobs. But this is also something that can be translated when you look at, for example, other types of intervention, which is the cohesion policy of the European Union whose aim is fundamentally to achieve more development in the less developed areas of the European Union, especially very often those that have, as we have seen, some of the worst institutional quality in Europe. And when you take a look at the distribution, you see that in those places where you have uh, most European regions actually get relatively little money, but there are quite a few that receive more than 80, 100, or even 150 euros per capita on a given year for economic development. And here the results are interesting because if I just move one forward, uh, one slide forward, what we see in this graph is that if you spent, and this is the uh, bar, uh, black bars at the bottom, 80 euros uh, per capita per year on cohesion funds, you achieve a certain level of development. If you go to the great lines, that's you increase by 20 euros, your level of development increases. And if you go to the blue line, that's 120 euros, that's the threshold, then you still increase. But after 120 euros, the returns stop. You put 150, we've done the analysis for 200, 250, and the lines superimpose each other. This means that beyond 120 euros, unless you improve the quality of government, which is the main factor blocking the improvement of the returns of new investment, you don't achieve any higher growth. And when you put everything here together, this is translated into this sort of results in which what is important to see is that for the European Union, in order to achieve greater growth above a certain threshold, which is 80 euros per head, you are much better off by improving the quality of institutions than by adding any additional money. So the impact of any increase in quality of government is three times to three and a half times higher than a similar increase in funding for economic development. And these reinforce each other. The better the quality of government, the higher the returns in terms of additional investment. And what we find is that anything or any type of investment that goes beyond 120 euros per head per year does not yield any returns in the current circumstances across the European Union unless it is accompanied by a significant drive for the improvements of government efficiency, the reduction of corruption, the improvement of transparency and accountability, and a better rule of law. I mean, you could achieve, in theory, some improvement by putting more funding, but in order to achieve the same results than by improving institutions, you would have to increase the budget of cohesion funds by 2.7 times, something that is completely off the cards. But uh, of course, there are not just um, uh, impacts in terms of economic growth. There are other direct impacts, like in terms of employment. So if you have good quality institutions, you are more likely to generate better jobs, and these jobs are likely to be qualified and stable. The type of jobs you need in a much more competitive, much more integrated environment like the one we have at the moment. If you have lower quality institutions, the problem is that you first generate less jobs, and those jobs tend to be 
first of a lower level of qualification, they are more precarious and very often come associated with lower opportunities and longer periods of unemployment, especially for those with the lowest level of qualifications. But it's not just the direct impact. There's a significant indirect impact through which poor institutional quality, poor governance at the local level affects the returns of other policies. Let's think, for example, of innovation policy, the policy that is now one of the stars everywhere in the world, because we know that without significant innovation, it's very difficult in a more competitive world in which other parts of the world will have significant advantages, for example, in labor costs, that you need more innovation in order to increase productivity and in order to increase growth. Well, if you take a look at the graph in the middle, and what we have is actually divided quality of government on a scale from zero to one, with regions in one having the best quality of government and regions at zero having the worst quality of government in the European Union. What we get there is something very simple. If you have very poor quality of government, if you are in the lower third in terms of quality of government, or if you're the top 20% in quality of government, changes in quality of government don't matter that much for innovation capacity. But for the bulk of regions that are located between the in the second and third tiers, between 30% and 80%, quality of government is absolutely fundamental in order to determine the returns of innovation policy and with poor government quality, any type of innovation effort gets whittled down and doesn't make that much of a difference. Another indirect effect comes with infrastructure policies. And this is some tendency that we have observed. I put the example of Portugal, I put the example of Spain at the beginning. When you have weak institutions, when you have weak government quality overall, in terms of the type of infrastructure that you want to put, you go for visible, big projects, you go for glitzy infrastructure. You have a preference, for example, in the case of road infrastructure for big motorways, rather than go for the more humble, less visible, but perhaps more effective uh, secondary road. And what we find is that if you go for big infrastructure, uh, you go for glitzy infrastructure, you might get short-term electoral returns, but in the long run, that doesn't lead to far greater generation of jobs or far greater economic growth. By contrast, when you have a situation whereby you have much better quality of government, what we have found is that less developed regions, especially that have nevertheless a relatively good quality of government, they build motorways, but very often they combine motorways with a lot of secondary roads, which are virtually absent in terms of lower government quality places. And what you find is that that combination of motorways with secondary roads has led over time to more job creation and to more economic growth. And then of course, what you find here, if I can move the next to the next slide, is that in different types of regions, depending on their level of development, you end up with different types of economic outcome. And for example, uh, let's divide Europe and the less developed regions of Europe between what are called the low income regions. So regions in on the border with the Ukraine, on the border with Belarus, uh, very often that are still relatively poor in the European context, but have been growing fast. In those regions, still the traditional sort of cocktail, the traditional mix of policies of more infrastructure, more human capital and more investment innovation seem to work and they work relatively well. Of course, improving quality of government would accelerate the returns of those policies, but nevertheless, you can still invest in the traditional factors and get actual results in terms of job creation and economic growth. Uh, by contrast, if you take a look at the regions of South and Europe that are low growth regions, mainly because they got a much higher income still than those regions on the east of the European Union, but have been growing very, very little. What we have is that putting more money into infrastructure, more money into innovation is not yielding returns, unfortunately. And the two factors that still matter is fundamentally uh, improving 
uh, institutions and improving human capital. In fact, these are regions that have been in a what is known as a development trap. They have reached a certain level of development, which is relatively high in comparison to other less developed regions of the European Union, but they have been stuck there for quite some time, in some cases for decades, and this problem cannot be overcome unless you address the big infrastructure bottlenecks that are preventing this type of growth. So let me just start to highlight a bit what can be the implications for the Ukraine. When we talk about the Ukraine, we're talking about a country that would have many of the problems that we have seen in some of the less developed regions of uh, the eastern part of the European Union. So in the case of the Ukraine, like uh, virtually everywhere, but especially in less developed areas, what you'll have is a need to put institutions at the center uh, at the heart of any development strategy. And of course, one of the things that needs and is absolutely essential is to work on the quality of institutions and the quality of trust. So you need to know how do you improve the quality of local institutions? How do you improve, let's say, governance, government effectiveness? How do you reduce, reduce corruption? How do you improve the rule of law? And how do you make your governments at the local level with the reform and the decentralization reform, much more transparent, much more accountable, and governments that facilitate participation by the people. And how do you also make sure that you don't regress once you do some improvements to previous conditions, because the forces that are going to resist a change are significant. A second factor that is important is understanding the quality of institutions and how this impinges, how this affects economic development. Here, what is uh, good to see is that if you improve institutions, the likelihood that you're going to get not just affect the job creation factor and also affect economic growth, but you're also going to have impacts on a lot of other factors that are going to affect the prosperity of uh, many places within the Ukraine in the future. They're going to affect the levels of well-being and happiness of people, the level of sustainability, not just from an environmental perspective, but also from a social and economic perspective. And also they're going to affect the resilience, the capacity to bounce back in cases like when you have a crisis, like for example, the current COVID-19 crisis. There's also an important uh, task in order to try to discern what are the role of formal and informal institutions. Um, most of the analysis that I have highlighted has been more on the formal side, the rule of law, government effectiveness, transparency and accountability. The most informal part is corruption, but you also need to understand that all these factors are, are accompanied by a lot of other institutional factors that have an important impact on economic development. Factors like, for example, trust, factors like, for example, openness, fa factors like, for example, the question of diversity, and factors like, for example, the capacity to build consensus, de develop social capital, and create uh, important uh, bridges across uh, the board. And also, you need to understand the mechanisms through which all this works. Because we know that institutions matter, but how do they matter and what do you do? How do you intervene? And here I can only, I don't have time to develop it in, in detail, but things like improving digitalization for transparency, creating the conditions uh, that would uh, deter the generation of development, the training of civil servants is absolutely fundamental. The, the use of, uh, let's say, uh, digital means for putting everything out in, in the open so everyone can see what's going on within government. These are all factors that increase trust in the system and therefore facilitate much more, much greater levels of development. And then finally, and as importantly, once you do that, you need to improve policy. Because if you have better institutions, then you have better conditions for development and that allows you to actually develop far better, far stronger policies. As I said, not just in the Ukraine, but virtually everywhere in Europe and in the world, if we're going to achieve far greater development, if we're going to grow in a more sustainable, in a more resilient way, in a way that improves welfare, what we need to, is to focus 
on the institutional dimension. We need to focus on the efficiency of our governments. We need to address the important bottlenecks because by improving the quality of those institutions, we're going to make sure that we improve the fortunes of our territories and especially of the people that live there. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I'll be very happy to try to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this very interesting and informative presentation. Indeed, when we um when we think of development, we're mostly preoccupied with, uh, let's say, more um, obvious factors like investment or human capital. But what is clear to me after listening to your presentation is that we should, under no circumstances, overlook um, the role of institutions. And the data that you have shared with us, and we're very thankful for that, and it also looks like it's connected with a lot of work, um, clearly evidence that we have to focus on the capacity of uh, institutions if uh, we want to make things happen and move forward. Um, but with that, I would like to indeed um, put some um, questions on, um, on you. So um, we have received several, but I will just put one. When it comes to the impact of institutional quality on the economic development of regions, ranging from government efficiency, transparency and accountability to the rule of law to fighting corruption, how would you prioritize the course of action? In other words, where do we start? All right, so where do we start? It's not easy to, to make a distinction because this is all integrated. It's not that we can say, let's start by government efficiency or let's start by uh, uh, tackling corruption or let's start by transparency, accountability. Everything has to be done in conjunction because you cannot improve government efficiency if you not tackle corruption at the same time. You cannot improve transparency if you do not make your government more efficiency. And of course, if corruption is rife, you're not going to achieve any sort of transparency and accountability. So there's a need to put everything together, making sure that you are doing what might seem at the beginning, uh, little by little, improving all other factors in order to make sure that once you achieve that, uh, the facts tend to become bigger and bigger and eventually you'll have end up with much better institutions. You cannot accept a piecemeal type of solution in which you actually go for one, let's say, let's tackle corruption, or let's improve transparency. It has to be a concerted effort tackling all dimensions that represent a significant block for economic development from an institutional perspective. Belief in the last minute that we still have, we could maybe take a look at the outcome of our poll question. So just to remind um, the audience, the question was, um, what do municipalities in Ukraine need the most to develop? Investment, education and skills, money, good institutions and governance, or trust and cooperation between people? Can we have a look at the results of this uh, question? Thank you. So, Professor, what are your thoughts when you see this? Well, I think that uh, the message is getting through that institutions are absolutely fundamental. I imagine that if I had asked or this question had been asked about a decade ago, the biggest uh, response would be money, education and skills and investment. And there would be very few people focusing on institutions and government effectiveness. Uh, what I think is that uh, all the factors that have been... What are your thoughts when you see this? All the factors that are there are factors that are absolutely fundamental in terms of uh, achieving economic development. You need good institutions and you need trust and cooperation between people. But this, in order to improve your institutions, you need investment, you need money, and you need also better education and skills. So when you have this concerted effort in which you, on the one hand, improve the skills with better investment, and you target part of that investment to address the important problems, institutional problems of government effectiveness, uh, transparency and accountability, of fighting corruption, of lack of trust in the system, with adequate investments and put institutions as one of the pillars together with human capital, with infrastructure, within, with innovation, you have the right type of structure, the right type of policy to make sure that you are on the right track to achieve much greater development and the generation of jobs, 
and growth that are far more sustainable than the situation you have had in the Ukraine for the last uh, few decades. Thank you so much, Professor. With this, we conclude our session and we go back to Yevgen.